PMAST. Let's kick things off as promised. Uh, I know we'll, more people will join us, but uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us. It's very exciting to see you and that you found some time on Friday just to connect and listen more about automation and how you can take your firm to the next level. Um, my name is Anita. Uh, some of you have seen me before. I'm one of the co-founders of the company called LifeFlow. Uh, what we do, we automate advanced financial reporting. Um, the goal of the company is very simple. It's just to make uh, the financial management part of your job way, way easier, way more streamlined uh, uh, with the best technology. Yeah, just a little bit more about ourselves. So here uh, you can see... Uh, We've been trying really hard on the technology and customer satisfaction side. That's that's why the badges, um, I really hope they reflect what we try to build at the company. We are very passionate about helping accounting and finance professional to become better at their everyday job by just removing all of the routines that you guys have. Um, and if you ever have a question like how you can take your company to the next level, we are more than happy to help you do really invest a lot in our customer support and success. And today, um, I brought James and Duinka from Matcha to the series of our webinars. Um, James and Duinka, please introduce yourself. Tell us more about Matcha and what you guys do as a fractional CFO firm. Awesome. Thank you, Anita, for, for having us. Uh, it's great. Um, so we have a few slides prepared, and then we'll um, jump into a demo um, of our, you know, a reporting package that we, or one of the reporting packages that we offer to our clients. And obviously demonstrating the life flow integration as well. Um, so uh, there's going to be four sections here today. Um, we'll give a brief matcha intro. We'll talk about the role of automation and why it's so important and how tools like LifeFlow can enable that and uh, help us add value to our clients. Um, and then we'll get into demo and then we have a QA and a at the end. Uh, so we can, we can talk about various different aspects of, of what we're presenting. Okay, a little bit of background. Um, so our mission is to um, enable founders of tech startups, right, to focus and scale. Um, you know, the, the really critical thing about the initial years of growth is, is really about finding product market fit. So if we can enable uh, more intense focus by taking all of the finance and accounting uh, issues of founders plates, then that can really enable them to double down in terms of their time and their focus on finding product market fit. And obviously, once they found product market fit, they need to build scalable systems, scalable processes. So it's all about scalability after that, right? So um, our mission is to enable that um, and make them successful, um, you know, by providing end to end finance accounting services. Um, so we do cover the full range. I have a, a list of things here that um, I'm grouped into uh, different sort of themes. Um, we offer end-to-end um, -end services um, for finance and accounting, um, anything from the basic bookkeeping uh, to KPI dashboarding, equity management, financial statements, for an NA valuation support, um, um, whole automation of processes and process design internally, um, and then uh, CFO advisory services. Um, for example, acquisition due diligence support, fundraising support, um, board meeting support, communications to the board, you know, those sort of things. Um, so we take care of everything from A to Z. Um, uh, and there's obviously an element of customization depending on what the client's needs are. Um, but there are lots of commonalities and our main focus is obviously doing it in the most productive way possible. Um, so we typically um, uh, charge, we, we aim to charge on a fixed monthly basis. We want to understand the scope, we get to steady state uh, and then provide, you know, a fixed set of services for a given price every month. So there's sort of predictability around it. And then on top of that, we have to, of course, also charge on an hourly basis for certain aspects of our work because some things are just unpredictable, like an acquisition due diligence can't be predicted. Um, so we typically work on an hourly basis for those for those types of services. Okay, and obviously uh, cloud software uh, and partnerships are really important for our service delivery to our clients. Um, we've listed our main sort of partners here and main, main apps that we use. There are more, but just to give, give you a flavor, um, you might 
notice that we've kept Silicon Valley Bank here on this list. Um, we, uh, we very much hope that they um, continue to exist and grow. Um, they've been tremendously valuable um, here in Silicon Valley and not just in Silicon Valley specifically, but for tech startups nationwide. Um, they do provide or have provided tremendous services and tools for tech startups. Uh, and we hope, of course, that that will continue under new ownership. So we're keeping it on this list for now. Uh, all good here. Um, and obviously, LifeFlow is on there as well. Good. So let's talk a little bit about automation and how we think about automation. Um, it's actually a, a, a super important uh, piece of our toolkit, right? If we are trying to drive service quality, value delivery, um, and team satisfaction, right? There's sort of probably these sort of three main ways that um, automation um, uh, and, and, a, and a really religious focus on productivity can help drive um, service quality, right? So it reduces errors. If we can automate and remove that human factor, right? The human error out of the equation, um, that reduces errors. Um, we can be much faster in the way we respond and report um, when we get new data and then report to the board or do live re uh, in real time reporting internally with our clients. So timeliness is super important and automation can, can enable that. Uh, and just a higher confidence overall, right, in the reporting and the data. Um, the delivery of, of uh, or the value that we can deliver to clients clearly dramatically increases. Uh, it's better data, means better decision making. Uh, better and faster data means a timely data uh, means increased credibility with stakeholders. So as our clients report out to the board or other investors, uh, or even to their own employees, uh, credibility increases, right? With with automation and with robust end-to-end -end systems. Um, uh, and then, um, of course, at the end of the day, we can deliver more value in terms of the output, but also we have, clients have, can, can spend less because our systems are very productive and we're automated. So in the long-term, everybody benefits, right? Because we can deliver the same value at lower cost long-term. And then team satisfaction. This is more kind of an internal matcha issue, um, but nobody wants to spend time day in, day out working on boring manual stuff, right? So what we're trying to do internally to motivate our team um, through automation is to take all this sort of manual work off the table as much as we can so that they can focus on higher value tasks. There's more, you know, job satisfaction, so to speak, um, and, and stress reduction because there's just more time to deliver, right? There's you're under less pressure to do a lot of manual work or basic work that we, repetitive work that isn't necessary. So reduces stress, makes the team happier and more positive with, and that, that translates of course, to happier clients as well. So this is how we think about it. Um, now, as we, as we think about technology choices, um, there's obviously this sort of big issue around make versus buy, right? And, and, Oftentimes, it's, it's described as a sort of a black and white situation. Um, there's shades of gray in this, right? And it's really important to, to make the right choices depending on what your objectives are um, and how you're looking to deliver value. So one way to think about it and the way we think about it, uh, I have here on the left, uh, flexibility um, and value delivery, right? So to, to what extent does an approach or a solution or a tool allow us to be flexible in how we deliver value. Um, and then at the bottom there, you have the cost dimension, right? So is it a costly way to deliver value or is it a, uh, a relatively low cost way or high cost way to deliver value, right? So off the shelf solutions, um, obviously tend to be the lowest cost solutions. You just pay a monthly subscription fee, you sign up, they take the data and they give you a certain output. Um, now, the challenge, of course, is you have very little control over that, very little flexibility and customization ability around that. So the flexibility in, with this approach is low. Um, uh, now, the, if, if that particular tool is a perfect fit for the, end, for the use case, the value can be sufficient and it's, it's a good solution. Um, in our experience, though, uh, tech startups don't come in it, 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 there are multiple flavors around this, right? It's an infinite set of uh, business models and, and needs and requirements. Um, so sort of off the sh shelf solutions don't always typically work for us. So the other option then would be to say, let's build our own 
in-house tools, right? So for example, let's build completely from the ground up our own models. Let's uh, get all the data, you know, from, from place A to a place B uh, and have a team doing all of that. Um, that gives us, of course, much higher flexibility and we can customize what we want to customize for every client. The cost, of course, is much higher, right? So we have to dedicate more in-house resources, the wingers time, et cetera, um, build out the team and spend many, many more hours uh, maintaining, building and maintaining these solutions. Now, LifeFlow really helps us in two ways. Um, first of all, um, because of that automation and that seamless connection between, say, QuickBooks and Google Sheets, um, it takes, it reduces our resource commitment, right? Our resource commitment and time that we need to dedicate to actually delivering output to our clients, uh, be it new reports or life reports. Um, but it also increases um, the ability for us to deliver more value, right? Um, because we can dedicate our team's time on the more higher value tasks. Um, and thinking through, for example, not just, you know, creating some metrics quickly and then doing a lot of manual updates, but are those the right metrics? Can we fine tune the metrics, right, to provide a better insight for clients? Um, so the LifeFlow helps us both on the resource side, but also increases flexibility and value delivery to our clients. And for us, at least the clients we have and the work we do, we feel this is sort of a sweet spot. Um, uh, in the way we think about technology. So uh, um, we do a lot of, um, our goal of course is to standardize to some extent, but we then also do customization for our clients depending on what their business model needs are, for example. Um, another way to think about it is that, um, and this is something we feel a lot of founders don't always necessarily understand, especially early on until they get into deep trouble. Um, data accuracy and data availability is so critical for decision making and for your reporting, right? Uh, and your investors have a very different view of these things than, let's say, an internal team coding some stuff has, right? It's 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 something that we bring to the table as as part of the, the discipline or perspective in all this. Um, so on the left here, you see obviously low data accuracy, high data accuracy, and then data availability, right? Is the data uh, late typically, or is it timely, right? Um, this is a, oftentimes what we what we encounter initially, it, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so it's low data accuracy um, and it's typically late, or you're always scrambling to pull some data together, right? Because you have a board meeting coming up or you need some internal data for decision-making um, and it it's just doesn't work. It's frustrating. Um, now we can accelerate that, um, and, and be fast and smarter at it. But if you have low data accuracy, you're still getting garbage in and garbage out. You're just getting it sooner. Um, that's also not really a sustainable solution. Now, the other option is let's really make sure we spend a lot of time on data accuracy, right? So we push data accuracy up, but we can't really, because of the sheer work involved in doing that, we can't deliver that data in a timely manner typically. And there's always stress, always scrambling. Uh, to get that data out there. So the way we feel um, this can be solved, and this is why I think LifeFlow for us at least adds, adds value, is that we can ensure both high data accuracy and deliver that data in a timely manner. And only then we believe data can, can be actionable and is credible, right? Um, uh, and there's obviously a number of benefits from this, faster decision-making, better decision-making, very important stakeholder communications uh, in, good, in, in a good place, right? You don't want to present to the board at one board meeting certain historical numbers, and then the next board meeting you have to correct it, and then the next board meeting you correct it again. It doesn't make sense, right? So you lose credibility. Um, it's super important that, that the data is accurate and that we can deliver the data in a timely manner and add value that way. Good. So. Um, we have a demo now. I'm going to hand over to Duinga, um, who's going to show you guys one of our reporting packages. Um, and we'll, uh, after that, we can get into uh, some of the, uh, the Q&A. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Duinga. Uh, I'm a financial analyst at Marsha. Um, by the way, I'm joining from Ghana in Africa. 
So um, just to give you a little bit of context, how we are thinking about this. So this is a reporting packet that we share with our client every month. But in building this, we are thinking, um, of course, in the context of automation, how do we make sure we can sustain this reporting package and we can scale this when we have more clients? And so um, the traditional way of doing this is to pull our data from QuickBooks and then to build our reports. And when there's new data, we go through the pain of downloading the data for each of the reports, manually cleaning this with the potential human errors, and then updating this, you know. And that's a bit counterproductive, counterintuitive. And this is where LifeFlow really came in handy for us. So what really LifeFlow, LifeFlow helped us to do was to integrate this in whole automation to connect Google Sheets to QuickBooks so that once our accounting team makes any update in QuickBooks, we are just a refresh away from having this in our report. And this gives our clients a lot of uh, comfort and credibility in terms of the data that comes in, is accurate, is available in time. And so with LifeFlow, we are just, like I said, we are just a click, a refresh away. So this is a typical reporting package. When you come here, all I have to do is to go to my extensions, and then under live flow extension, I can just refresh my report, or I can decide to, if I want to onboard a new client, I want to create a new report, I want to pull a new data set. Sometimes you have clients that make specific requests, okay, and then I need to pull a, request, um, a new data set. All I have to do is to just come here and then I can switch from one company to another. I can create a new report. Like for example, here I can flip and say, I'm, I'm changing a new, I'm, I'm adding a new client, I'm onboarding a new client. And this whole process can take like three, four minutes at most, you know. And especially when you're refreshing the entire report, and it's, it's just in a few seconds, a minute at most. And that's how LifeFlow helps us really to answer those two questions. Sustainability, for us to be able to maintain these reporting packages, you know, without committing too much resources and being able to deliver quality uh, work in a productive way. And then in scalability so that when we have more clients or more people requesting this, we can all, always onboard them. I'm going to spend some time to walk you through the, the package, how it works. So what you see here is, like I said, the typical report that we share with the client. The, this dashboard is more like an executive summary, right? That shows you I mean, depending on the client, but in, term, in terms of standard, you see the burn rate. So what you see here, for example, for this client, they have about three months net burn uh, runway. Their payables are around 42K. They've made a gross margin of 64%, and that's about 1.5 million in net losses. And then we have like three charts here. The first chart shows you essentially the, the cash balances uh, over the last 12 months you know, how this has evolved. And then here you see the total income against the total expenses for uh, the last 12 months. And then we have their burn, their net and their gross burn uh, charts here. Over here, what you see here is a table for the reporting months. By the way, the reporting month is April, 2023 here. So this table here simply shows you the top 10 customers for this client in April, you know, and this is this is quite time driven. So you can decide to slice this whole dashboard here and look at maybe the last six months. So if I do last six months, you see all these charts and the reports update and show you for the last six months how uh, the company is doing. Then the reporting package also gives you an insight into the the three financials. So. Um, we have a SaaS KPI here that we'll talk about at the end of the demo. So I'll just walk you through the other stuff. So we have a PNL. This is a more consolidated view of what you'd have seen in uh, in QuickBooks. You know, so here you can clearly see based on the classes the total expenses, and then we have a time dimension here. What you see here is historical. It's existing data for 2022. But you can decide to look at it, let's say for 2023, if I do this, my report just updates, you know, and shows me for 2023, 
Q1, Q2, I can show um, the year to date numbers over here as well. And then I can shut down some of the noise by closing this, I'll collapse this. So here you see uh, the PL for 2023, when you have new data at the end of May, our accounting team will update QuickBooks and then I just refresh and then in just a few seconds, the report is updated. The balance sheet is built on the same intuition, just like the cash flow. You have here for 2022, um, 2022, the balance sheet. And of course, we can slide this by and show, let's say for 2023, and then I can show the year to date, you know, high level, more consolidated. So just in a few clicks, you, you are able to see clearly how your balance sheet looks like. Same for your cash flow here. Okay. Then the reporting package now drills a bit down into some of the reports. So when you take your PL, for example, you probably want to look at PL based on classes. Uh, let's say your general and admin expenses against your sales and marketing expenses, for example. So this report here allows you to do that drill down. So over here, you can, you can choose a class. At the moment, we are looking at G&A, right? And so these are the income statement lines for G&A. And so for whatever period um, or month you choose, you can see the last three months up to that month, right? Showing you a trend of how the numbers evolve, okay? And we've done a little bit of conditional formatting here just to make it easy for the client to see which lines are doing well, which ones are not doing well. So a green, for example, for the expenses make, means that they've done some cost savings, right? So I can change this to sales and marketing. And so this shows you all expenses attributable to sales and marketing. And then this is April. If I say uh, February, it shows me the last three months up to February and shows me how these various expenses have evolved. And then here it flags the, the line that they've saved on, the ones that uh, the losses have increased or the expenses have increased. And then um, what you see here is the absolute dollar change from this February, I mean, from January to February. And then you have the percentage change here. Because to really, in terms of relevance and materiality, we are only showing the um, expenses that are higher than $5,000 or um, more than 5% of the total expenses. So here, for example, if you have an expense that's not, let's say, up to 5% of the total expenses, we assume it's not too material you know, for the client. So this report is quite important. It helps really the client to look on class basis, how each of these lines um, are doing. you know. And then we have our account receivables analysis. So you know, in QuickBooks, you have a different view. What we are doing here, is showing you the breakdown of what you saw here on the dashboard. We have receivables of 611K. When you see here, it shows you the buildup or the breakdown of that. And so from the highest receivable to the lowest, the lowest is about 100 for uh, the reporting period. And then of course, you can see the receivables that are overdue, what percentage of our receivables are overdue. And then when you look at, say, our top 25 receivables, what's, what, what is that amount and what does that make up to in terms of the total receivables? Then there is this, which is somehow my favorite. Um, so here we do a little bit of drill down into the vendor expenses, you know. Now, especially for startups, having an eye on your, your expenses is very key, right? So what you have here, is um, a report that is in two folds. The first level is to drill down on classes and subclasses. So let's say I'm looking at uh, GNA, for example. So I'll take a class, let's say GNA, and then I'll zoom into the subclasses within GNA and say, maybe you want to look at uh, finance. So I'll take finance. And so in terms of GL accounts, this is how it looks like for the last six months. So this is a six month rolling, showing me that subcontractors made up the highest um, 
uh, vendor expenses over the last six months, and that's 275,000 USD. Now, once you do this, you may now be interested in knowing what vendors made up or which vendors did we pay this money to, you know? So we can now decide to drill down and see the breakdown of this. So here I'll go again and say, um, G and A, um, finance. And then I'll say, I'm looking at subcontractors. So I'll look at the particular general accounts, which is subcontractors. And so you see that this is a breakdown of the 275,000. So you'd see that in November, it was 29,000. It was paid to two vendors here. And then in December, there were three vendors here making the 66,000 that you see up here all the way to April. In April, there were only two vendors that's uh, in our report, you know. And this allows you to slice and dice the data for the vendors and then understand your spending patterns, the, the vendors that they pay to, you know. And then we have two more reports. There is the, the, the total expenses by vendors. Now, the difference between this report and the previous one I just showed you is that this shows you more like the total. The previous report is on the class levels. You know, we are drilling down on the class level. Here, we are looking at our total vendors. And then we have two dimensions here. You can look at this from a timeline. So here, I'm showing you the year to date, uh, top 15, um, top 15 vendors, right? And then I can choose to show you just for the reporting month, which in this case is April. And so this will update and show me the top 15 vendors for the reporting month. That's the month of April. Of course, if you want to just focus on maybe the top five or the top 10, you have a drop down here that allows you to say, okay, let's look at just the top five. Or maybe we want to look at maybe just the top 10 vendors, you know, and then what about year to date of the top 10 vendors, you know? And so you can see this, and then this gives you a lot of context to decision-making in a timely way, you know, and uh, the last report in, in our reporting package is the, account payables, it's just like the account receivables. So here we show you the breakdown of what you see on the executive summary here, um, 42K in payables. So you can see the breakdown in terms of the highest payable all the way to the lowest. And then you can also decide to how many payables you want to, or vendors you want to display. So here we are showing five, I can do 10. When I do 10, yeah. There you go. So my report will update and show you from the highest to the lowest top 10 payables within their brackets or the, their buckets, right? From current all the way to those payables that are overdue. And then you can see out of the 42,000, about 30, um, 13K is overdue. And that's just about 32%, you know? And like I keep saying, life flow allows us to really make this whole process seamless and fast. If I am just need to update this, I go in here, live flow, and then I can refresh and all my reports will refresh. Once there's new data from QuickBooks, everything updates, you know. So um, this is our reporting package that we, we have. Of course, I left the SaaS KPIs, which James would walk you through and tell you how that works. But in, uh, in general, this is our reporting package from Matcha. So James, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dewinga. So we'll just sort of round this off with um, sort of some SaaS KPI uh, um, discussion here or dashboarding. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of the SaaS KPI dashboards that we've built. Um, uh, it's broken out into different sections. So there's sort of a bookings section. Um, and as you can see, we're also projecting forward. This integrates with the uh, broader financial modeling effort as we, you know, beyond the reporting package, we, we obviously build full financial models, uh, also using life flow um, uh, to support that. And so some of the data, of course, flows in from this, from that, from that modeling. So you have your bookings data uh, um, uh, and then churn, churn rates. Um, we have a revenue section here where we have revenue metrics, 
cash section, right, for cash metrics. Uh, of course, very important things like runway uh, and net burn. Um, and then we have a customer section here, some customer metrics um, where we do counts and average value and retention rates. Um, there's an ROI section, uh, return on investment section, um, where we calculate things like you know, custom acquisition cost, months to recover the CAC, lifetime value, and then lifetime value um, over CAC ratio. Um, obviously, the, you see conditional formatting here, so we can automatically set targets for each of these metrics and then automatically highlight um, using different color coding, right, if those values, if those thresholds are either above or below those targets, uh, the values are above or below those targets. So 16 here, of course, is worse than the 12 target here, so it's, it's turning up red. Um, scale efficiency metrics as well, um, you know, if you guys are in, some of you are into SaaS, you obviously recognize these metrics. Uh, rule of 40 is very, very popular. There's different, you know, SMA growth index um, is here, magic number. Um, and we also get into things like, you know, more fine-grained calculations around cost of service, which is important for, um, you know, some of these metrics up here. Now, uh, the important thing to note, though, um, building successful um, KPI dashboards, especially for SaaS, is really more than just math. Um, you really need to be careful. It's, it's a rabbit hole, right? You can run down this rabbit hole. There are a ton of metrics out there. Um, and depending on who you talk to, you might have investors that have certain, they make, they, they make tweaks to the, to the numbers or to the, to the KPIs. Um, and it also depends on the stage you're in as a company. Um, and it also depends on what kind of specific business model you have. Um, so you have to be very careful when you calculate these KPIs and present them. Um, it's not just Googling it, cracking numbers and then presenting it to the board. You have to be very smart about that. You can, it, it can backfire, right? If you're not careful about what cost components, for example, you include and how you adjust some of these metrics given your particular circumstances. Um, but that's also part of the value we deliver, of course, when we work with you on these things. And obviously all the data here is, you know, the underlying data flows from what the Winger showed you and from QuickBooks and, and uh, from our financial reporting um, enabled by LifeFlow, of course. Good, so that's the end of our intro here, Anita. Um, maybe we can jump into a Q&A part or? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That's been very informative and um, we learned a lot, I guess, all together. So we have a bunch of questions. Uh, Natalie kicked it off. And the first one is, uh, could you show us more about the workbook structure? Are there hidden life reports on a different tab uh, that you're referring to with formulas on the main reports? And are you using index match for your main formulas? Okay, that's a very... Te good technical question. Technical so can, question. <laughs> can you, uh, Let's just, break it down. Yeah. Well, the, the first, I guess, is, so, is already answered. Are there hidden live flow reports on a different tab that you're referring to? Well, I guess the answer is yes. You just did not present the standard live flow reports, right? So how do we, do you want to comment on that, how we built that up? Yes, yes. So again, we pulled a report from QuickBooks using live flow. And then we do a lot of schedules, a lot of calculations. So those sheets are not relevant for the clients. You know, it just makes the whole report noisy. So they are hidden. They are hidden. And then yes, we do a lot of lookups. And then uh, there's a combination of index match match and X lookups at some places. But yeah, we use a lot of index match and uh, X lookup as well. We are yeah, looking in, in general, by the way, wherever we can, we use X lookup, not index match. Yeah, you, you were the first one sexual out of our customers who reached out. And also that formula was new and Google Sheets did not really update the apps like ours with the new formula. So it wasn't compatible. We had to troubleshoot it uh, with Google to figure out how that actually works. And now it works thanks to you guys. And XLOOKUP, well, we are huge fans of Index Match. And if anyone ever goes to our templates, they are all pre-built on Index Match and it, it allows you to do incredible things. But XLOOKUP is the new formula that was released by Google. When was that? I think last autumn or so? It was, was eight it? months ago, I think. Roughly eight, eight months. 
Yeah. Okay, so fairly new, um, and it's kind of a combination of uh, index match that is just a little bit more efficient that scans rows and columns and brings you the target number. Uh, yeah, I strongly recommend that. We haven't migrated our templates to it just because we have over 100. Uh, but yeah, if uh, there are geeks out there who love to learn new formulas, definitely recommend checking out uh, XLOOKUP. Can I just uh, make a comment on this, by the way? Um, and Dewinga, you can probably agree that when we had issues or when, when we discuss this with with life flow how long did it take them to fix it or respond to it almost immediately yeah <laughs> right. yeah so, it was it was so like unusual that the formula would not work with live reports and break them and we never ever had seen it before so we had to like put an alarm like we need to solve it because it might be that more customers use this formula and what do we do? Uh, so that, that was very unusual as a bug. <laughs> yeah, and we were grateful for your, I mean, it's amazing how fast you guys work. So thank you. Thank you. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, well, another question from Natalie, how did you get such nice colors in the drop down buttons? Uh, okay, so- uh, <laughs> Maybe so you guys want to show it how to yeah, set up yeah, the, yeah, this no format. Set. <laughs> yeah, so so we actually have a designer, by the way, uh, in house as well, who helps us with the look and feel of that. But there's actually a way to um, use hex values. Um, you can go in and and do a custom color choice in Google Sheets, and then you get to a point where you have another click to make, and then it it asks you even for a hex value. You can type a hex value in um, to be very very specific as to what color you want, um, and then you can color it that way or format the, the cell that way. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward once you know how to do it. Right, okay, cool. Um, next question. What kind of training uh, do you give to the client to help them navigate these dashboards? Do you go over it with them live, Nicole? Do you create a PDF of this report? What do you guys do? So we share it live. So we don't believe in uh, creating separate client versions. Uh, and then sort of lock them down. You know, we we actually uh, even work on them live when, for example, Dewinga or other team members work on those reports and fix them or add to them or upgrade them. Uh, we do it live in front of our clients. Um, and uh, I think that's important because actually there's an element of transparency and trust and they can see that we're doing good work and we're doing the work life and we've, um, they appreciate that. So we actually share these live versions with them and we work on those live versions directly. That applies to pretty much yeah every single model we build, including the bigger financial models. Uh, it's all live in front of the clients. One question though um, that we receive all the time. So how do we make it clear that if it's not the end of the month and like the numbers are not updated in QuickBooks, the client should not require you to do things ASAP because they have the live numbers and it might look a little bit off if the transactions are uncategorized or whatever else happened that is not done yet. How do you communicate that the reports are live, but they are not um, in a great trap at all times? Like, how do you present it? Yeah, we actually, first of all, make it very clear to them that we can, the data is not credible until we've completed month and close on the accounting side, right? So that typically takes a couple of weeks into the following month, right, for the previous month. Um, and, and we're very clear about that because there, again, it comes back to this um, GIGO issue, right? Do you wanna rush some stuff out there and then present garbage and having to backtrack or do you actually take take a moment and, and a reasonable about when the data is actually ready? Um, so that's, that's something we do as part of expectation management very clearly. Now, the way the Winga and the team have built some of these, the reporting package, um, it automatically actually locks them out of, so for example, right now it's May, right? So they can't see May data, um, right? So they can only see the data up to the last closed month. So that's all locked down. They have no choice in that. That's good, yeah. okay. And, and then Anita, maybe I can add quickly. Mm -hmm. So we we, we have kind of a guide in the in the reporting package in terms of the color coding that shows the close status. So when you see green on top, it tells you that the numbers there are final. Oh, the that's that's very helpful. Yeah. So, yeah. And then when you see um, the the orange type of color, it tells you that it's either work in progress or we've not started the month and close. So you may see numbers, but the month is not close yet. You know. 
Yeah, that that's very helpful. I think you have like a status bar on top of each of exactly. the month. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. great. All right. Uh, the next question is for SaaS KPIs. This data is not generally in QuickBooks. Do you put it all into QuickBooks? No, the, the, the data doesn't, the, the SaaS metrics don't sit in QuickBooks. It's not a good tool for that. Um, this is why we, it's so important to build these kind of models outside QuickBooks. Um, so we don't put that in QuickBooks. It lives only in our models. Um, obviously, QuickBooks is good for pure accounting data, but anything else beyond that, you, you do need to build your own models. It comes back to what I mentioned earlier that it's not just as simple as, for example, calculating gross profit margin, right? I can use QuickBooks and come up with a gross profit margin or metrics like that. Um, when you get into SaaS metrics and KPIs, you have to be careful. It's uh, you, you need to make sure you capture the right cost items, you adjust for different time periods, you adjust for the kind of business model that you have. For example, cost of service will differ depending on your business model. So if you're not careful about that, you can completely misrepresent your business and shoot yourself in the foot when you go out there and present it to your board or your investors. Um, so it's super important to do it right. Right, thank yeah. you so much. And James, let me, let me also add that uh, we also build financial models as part of uh, service that we provide. And so some of these KPIs are also pulled from the main model that we build for our client. You know, makes it easy to calculate some of these KPIs. Maybe you want to add like which other platforms the data flows from and if you found a way to automate those. So we didn't, so no, we actually, our main platforms in terms of the, the raw data is QuickBooks, typically NetSuite sometimes, and then we have Google Sheets. That's the, that's the, those are the main sources for all this data. Um, um, and then obviously the models, the, the bigger models we build where we model the whole business model and project forward five plus years, right? Um, that's a separate, also using Google Sheets. We uh, used to use early on Excel, um, but we moved away from that quickly because uh, we had too many issues with collaboration. So Google Sheets is our standard. We don't move away from that. We do in exceptional circumstances if a bank or an investor or somebody sends an Excel file for us to fill out for our clients with our clients, then of course we'll use Excel, but uh, Google Sheets is, is our, our platform. It's the right trade-off. Collaboration is the big, big plus there, including with our clients, right? That's why these are live versions when we share them with our clients, intentionally so. It's a very strategic choice. And yeah, we also have the same conversations, Google Sheets or Excel, and it feels like the market is obviously split uh, into almost two equal parts right now. And people do love Excel. And it's very hard to forget uh, your muscle memory and like just switch to something brand new. But Google Sheets definitely have a bunch of advantages. Of course, there are people who love Excel and it's hard to argue, right? Uh, it's, oh, it's very fast and efficient, but still um, Google Sheets... Um, I, I'm making some moves and uh, we're very excited about it. Well, Excel is the, the, the power tool for sure, right? Excel is more sophisticated um, than, than Google Sheets still today. Um, there's no doubt about it. And I think in certain use cases, it absolutely makes sense. If I'm a big bank on Wall Street and I build massive, complicated models that are really truly for that purpose, or I'm a conglomerate and I'm building, it's very different. But I, I think with Google Sheets, we get, say, 75% of, of what Excel can do, let's say I'm, I'm, it's not a scientific statement, it's a, an intuition, um, but we get, you know, all the functionality we need plus seamless collaboration. And in, especially in this world today with remote work, right? And distributed work, um, it's super, super important. Um, and it's, it's a huge productivity boost for us and our clients. So that's why for us, Google Sheets makes sense. All right, we have one more question. Um, do you use LifeFlow for the underlying work papers for close? So, yes, uh, we do in a sense that we use it to help the accounting team uh, track errors and identify errors. Um, and so we use LifeFlow that way. Yes, in fact, uh, the team has built out tools that make the month and close process more efficient and, and help them catch errors and, and you know, uh, in, in the numbers. Yes. So we do use it for that as well. 
Right. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys have more questions? Anything else that anyone wants to ask? All right, another another question here. Is much as reporting package available as a template? It looks incredible. And I totally agree with that. Do you guys share this template? <laughs> By any chance? <laughs> so we share it after you become a client. Um, so I have to say we don't share that. Uh, and frankly, you know, I think there's also always work to be done to actually connect it properly and make it work, right? So it's unfortunately not just a straightforward, simple template. Um, so forgive me, but unfortunately, we, we can't share it just like that publicly. Um, but thank you for the feedback. We appreciate it. We actually have a great in-house designer as well who helps us design these things as well. Um, thank you for your feedback. Well, at least it can serve as inspiration. Maybe, guys, if you can advise on a couple of formulas, I understand it's a popular question here. Like, how do you actually build the whole thing? Like, where's the magic happening? Um, I guess many, many uh, attendees of this webinar, they will be able to build it themselves. So, yeah, if, if any, any sources, anything that inspired you to build it, that would be very helpful. Yeah, and you're, you're welcome to... Uh contact us right if there's any questions about any of this if we can help we're happy to help you uh, feel free to email us here um, if that's helpful at all and obviously the life flow team is knows even more of course about about all this as well um, so uh, obviously life flow is there too <laughs> yeah we're obviously very happy to help uh we don't have the same template uh just <laughs> just giving you the answer straight away but we have like a combination of things and actually what i saw was and a bunch of templates that we already have, for example, the analysis of um, a class and uh, accounts under the class or uh, accounts payable, account, accounts receivable, top X uh, payables, et cetera. It's all available within LifeFlow under templates, both on the website and inside the product. And what we launched today is the feature that allows you to combine all of these templates in one spreadsheet. So what happened, customers were coming to us saying that, well, all of your templates are great, but I have different spreadsheets and they're not connected and I cannot send four spreadsheets to the client with payables, receivables, SaaS dashboard, whatever. I want it all together. And we spent some time learning how it would be possible just to indicate to Google that we want to copy the template with all of the live reports and formulas into the existing spreadsheet that you've built up to a certain point. And uh, that happened. So today we launched this feature um, that is appearing under create reports and it's called uh, import from another spreadsheet. And then you just choose the template that we already have, or you can paste your own spreadsheet where you already have the uh, report set up for another client, click import, and it will just bring all of it together nicely and you can scale it to another client of yours. So it's a very exciting update for me personally, because I, I, I've received a lot of customer support tickets asking that. <laughs> great. All right. Uh, do you have more questions or is it a wrap? Another question. <laughs> LifeFlow is an amazing product in my experience so far. I pray you never go to business. <laughs> there are lots of runway. I don't know who wrote this. It's very funny. Um, I also hope so. And uh, yeah, if if many of uh, people who are attending our webinar today sign up, we will definitely not go out of business. So it will help <laughs> us a lot. But yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for your feedback. Uh, all right. Anyone else has uh, any questions? Anything that you want to ask before we wave goodbye? Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, been uh, a good fun. Uh, we'll follow up with the email with the recording of the webinar. And um, any questions, let us know or reach out to James uh, to ask about the formulas and color coding. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you all. Bye.